Welcome to the Voyage Clinics podcast. I'm Dr. John with the Voyage Clinics. Um, our mission with this podcast is to bring knowledge and wisdom to our communities, uh, families and business owners. Uh, today we have a really special guest, Zach Lovinger. He's one of my favorite people on the planet. And my wife will be joining us in a minute. Uh, she's just running behind right now. She's got some stuff cooking. Um, so today we really wanted to talk about a couple of things that everyone, everyone has to deal with, and that is healthcare. So healthcare coverage, um, specifically coverage in like the insurance space. And then are there other options out there? Um, individuals dealing with coverage and then small employers dealing with coverage for themselves and their employees, and then maybe medium sized employers and even large employers. And what are kind of some of the innovative options out there in those spaces? So Zach, uh, yes. I'd like you to just spend a moment to tell us your journey. Uh, tell us about you, introduce yourself, tell us, you know, your credentials, and then, um, talk to us about your journey in healthcare. Okay. Well, thanks for having me here. Yeah. So, um, my, yeah, my name is Zach Lovinger. Um, I've been doing this since about 2005. Um, I found myself a young father, uh, been married about three years, three, four, yeah, three, three, three years. Um, and I was, I was working in a, in a nursing facility as a social worker or social services worker. Um, and I really, really enjoyed that. I really love helping people. Mm. And so I, um, I wanted to do more. And I noticed that in the nursing home, a lot of, a lot of my friends, uh, or clients, uh, the patients there in the nursing facility had a lot of questions and the families would come in and ask me questions about, Hey, how does, how does Medicare work? And how does this work and that work and, and everything. And I found myself helping people understand Medicare. And so I, I, I grew up, um, in a home with, uh, myself and six other siblings, my parents, my mom, um, was fortunate enough to be able to stay home. She was a stay at home mom, probably worked harder than my dad times three or times 10. Um, but she, she was able to, we were blessed enough to have her stay home. And I wanted to be able to offer that lifestyle to have that be, um, available to my wife and to my family. Um, not that I, she had to, but it was an option. So I needed to make, um, a better income than being a, a social services worker in a nursing facility earning $10 an hour. But I think it was really cool that you were helping people understand Medicare. I would say most doctors don't really understand Medicare, <laughs> including yeah. myself. It is a convoluted, complex thing. And and that's the thing is, is I was finding that it was constantly changing Every year there were new programs that came out and, yeah. and here we have, you know, so my undergrad, I graduated from BYU in, in marriage, family, human development with a dual minor in gerontology and social work. Really? So I, I love learning, um, from that older generation, people that have walked through life already yeah. Yeah. and they have so many stories. And if, you look at other cultures like the um, the Japanese culture or the Asian cultures where the elderly are kind of revered and deif not necessarily deified, but they're put up on a pedestal and and they're seen as wise. And, and I think here in our society, we kind of tend to push them off, mm. um, but there's so much to learn. And so I... That's what took me on my journey is, cool. is I, um, I chatted with a, a couple different agencies that are out there. Insurance um, agencies. I, insurance yeah. agencies that would understand that I could refer my clients to. And I found some really good ones out there. Um, but I, I, the background, there was always the money side of, of what they were looking for. Uh, I'm going to. Um, recommend this product because this is what I make the most commission on, or this is what, and it didn't sit right with me. 
you're really kind. That was like your kind way of saying like some brokers are scumbags. And I'll just say, Zach, <laughs> I've worked with you for a long time and you are like one in and probably 10,000. I've, I've, I've talked to a lot of brokers and they have a lot of things in common. And that is often one of them where they're upselling this product and that product because they make better commission on this and this and that. One thing that I like about you is that for my clients, we refer to you often for coverage needs for my clients, um, for my patients and things, is that you always have that client's best interest in mind, not your pocketbook. And and you've done things for my patients that give you zero feed, or kickback or any any kind of like commission or any of that. And I think that's really cool. And it speaks to your character as one in 10,000. Like you're just a really good dude. Um, so tell us about your, your, your brokerage, like your, um, you have your own brokerage, you mm -hmm. have a brokerage license. Tell me the credentials there that are necessary to, to do that and what, what you're doing there. Oh, hold on. We have another special guest joining us. Shauna, hi, hey, come sit right here. here. All right. Hi, Zach. Hey, Shauna. Shauna is actually my favorite guest. So I was just I one you, of your you favorite were guests. guests. Oh, yes. <laughs> Did he tell you you, you I, were his I, favorite I, guest? He told me I was one of okay. his favorite guests. I, I That's true. Have, I'm sure it's true. So, uh, so welcome, Shauna. Thanks. Um, we were just talking about Zach's journey in like healthcare and in in the in the insurance space, and he was just going to break down kind of his credentials right now and how he helps people navigate uh, cool. healthcare right yeah. now. Uh, we're going to keep talking Great. and and just uh, we'll ask you a few questions here in a minute. Okay, that's fine. Zach. Okay. So um, back in 2005, um, I took my insurance exam uh, and I, I passed the insurance exam and I, and I had a, a young wife and a, and a beautiful new baby. Um, and I just wanted to, to make a difference. So I wanted to speak a little bit about what you mentioned um just kind of the compliment you gave me in the last 30 seconds of um, kind of one in 10,000. I wouldn't say one in a million, but when, I mean, we're... there's quite a few of them, <laughs> but um, it, it, the insurance industry is, is tough. It is really tough to get started um, because you have two decisions, you know, your, your family's at home and you, you got to put food on the table. Um, and so, the, you know, if you don't sell a product or a plan, there's not going to be a commission, which there's not going to be an income. And you don't and, start with a salary. It's no. eat what you kill. 100%. You got to bring in commissions in Ab order to start life. Absolutely. I get it. So that's got to be a tough startup. I had the similar, similar things as I started Voyage, mm -hmm. direct primary care for which was clinics. It was a very challenging situation Four kids, wife's in school. And I'm like, free falling. You were probably free falling at the time. Yeah. So first starting out, it was, it was tough. The industry or, or business is tough. Small business is tough. So, um, I just help people understand Medicare and I approached it in that way of helping, um, helping people understand their options. Mm, cool. And so I'm under a firm belief that if I, there's a, there's a law of the universe that's out there that, that says, if you help enough people get what they want, inevitably you get what you want. Mm. And taking care of my family was one of my primary concerns. Yeah. And so that's, that's how my business has grown. So, um, back in 2005, just started out, had a couple different agents and we just helped people understand Medicare and understand their options. Mm. And I found, so I went down the, so in the insurance brokerage, there's, you can go captive where you you essentially work for a company and you only offer their products. And I did that for a year. And I found that if a client didn't benefit from a product I sold, that, um, you had no other options, no other options. Yeah, I sure. could say, Hey, go down and talk to Joe Blow on the street or, yeah. Because you were captive by that. Correct. I see. And so that was really difficult. So after a year, um, I split off and became a broker where, wherein there's a, a couple more, um, you have to produce 
quite a bit more. You have to show these in the insurance carriers that you can produce um, a product. Bring and so, them clients. Correct. Mm. And with marketing plans and you're basically going to all these different carriers and and showing them, hey, here's my marketing plan. Here's my past. This is what I've done. So over the course of, you know, two, three years, I was able to build um, an agency wherein I I was able to bring in or recruit additional agents um, and train them. And when they would sell a product uh, or sell a program, um, then the commission would flow in. Mm, cool. Would come in. So that's awesome. kind of the background. Well, that's very good. Very good. Um, Shana, as far as coverage, as we're talking about today, we're talking about like coverage for people's healthcare, sure. um, insurance packages and various other, um, various other things. And I, I'd love for you to just kind of introduce yourself and then also tell us like where you've been digging around in the coverage space for, as it applies to various people. I think Zach has like individuals and maybe small companies dialed in and you've done a lot of research in maybe the medium to larger size companies. I want to ask you lots of questions on that. We're going to get to that towards the end. So give us just a little okay. small intro and then we'll, a teaser, and then we'll dive into the details in a bit. So, um, okay. So when I was in law school, um, Zach approached me, this has been several years now and said, Hey, like, why don't you study to do your producers to do a producer's license, which is um, basically what Zach already explained, which is a license to sell insurance plans for different to produce customers for insurance companies. Sure. So I studied and I did that. Um, that wasn't necessarily my main focus, mm -hmm. but it was just a a, a way to kind of get into the world of insurance because uh, of there's so much um, overlap in the medical industry between coverage and care. Yeah. And so um, I felt that it would be useful to have a, at least a basic understanding of coverage as it applies to individuals and families. But in that journey, I've been more uh, leaning towards finding out more about uh, group coverage, basically, because I studied the history of health insurance and health insurance has taken a little bit different track than other insurances um, in the United States. And so like back in the, I, I want to say it was the 40s or 50s post, during World War II, companies were trying to figure out some way that they could attract workers to work in their industries. And there was a kind of a cap on wages. And so they began to offer like hospital plans as a health benefit that had some tax advantages for the companies. And so health insurance, where which differs from car insurance or homeowner's insurance or any of these other insurance products, health insurance is different because oftentimes it's provided by an employer, not an individual or a family. And so I was more interested in learning a little bit more about that space and how employer-sponsored insurance coverage works. And so I've been doing a lot of research in that area. And it turns out that there are a lot more options than many employers are aware of. That's really It cool. just requires um, understanding and knowledge and the right movers and shakers within your company to, to put a plan in place. Super cool. We're going to dive into lots of details on that in a minute. Okay. Um, you were doing the JD MBA, took your um, insurance exam as well. Uh, Shauna is just a voracious academic. She's a nerd and I love her because she does. I wasn't going to say nerd. I was going to say voracious fine. academic. I, mean, I can, yeah, fine. I can I understand mean, that. Fancy way to I say wear it. the title proudly. I wish it came with a tiara. Oh, we could get you I one. Know. We could. Yeah. We're going to get and you one. And spelled out nerd in like glittery letters across the top. That would be nice. Or just yeah. voyage clinics. I guess you that's know. fine. Shana works at Voice Clinic. She does a lot of our business side of our operations and um, uh, she's wonderful. She's just a, a huge asset to so many of our clients and to me and just really grateful. She's also my wife. Um, uh, just so we're clear. <laughs> <laughs> I said love a couple of times. So just I've like been on the podcast before. Yeah, well, I not think our listeners listening know. Knows. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's talk about Let's talk about coverage, Kay. Let's just talk about it from fundamentals 101.0. I am, 
I'm 27 years old. I have a few kids. I have a wife. I have a few kids because I live in Utah. Anywhere else, I might not even have a kid yet. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but here I am, right? I'm a young family and I lost my job or my job doesn't offer insurance. What are my options there for coverage, Zach? Perfect. So traditionally, um, prior to 2010, um, the only way, well, take that back. It wasn't the only way, but the most positive way of getting coverage at that point is through an employer. Yeah. Find another if, job. They offer insurance. Yes. So if you have a pre-existing condition and by pre-existing condition, meaning if you went to the chiropractor two years ago because you had a, you slept wrong and have a pain in your back and they adjusted you, that goes in your medical records. And when you apply for insurance outside of an employer, if you applied for an individual policy, um, they look at your medical records for the last two to five years, mm. depending on the carrier, the insurance company. And that, um, I found myself in that position when I was self-employed. I didn't have an employer that offered benefits. And so we tried a couple different plans, but true story, when I went to the chiropractor because I slept wrong to get adjusted, that was in my uh, record and I couldn't get an individual plan. You couldn't get it or it was just going to be more expensive? I, I was declined. Denied. Denied. Really? Because I went to the chiropractor. That was 2010 and, and the before. Or, or before. That was about 2006, 2007. Mm. Uh, they would accept my wife because she was extremely healthy. Mm -hmm. um, not if she was pregnant at the time. Um, so, but prior to 2010, that was pretty much the only way you could get insurance. And every single health care clinic, chiropractor, et cetera, their data is poolable by those insurance companies, correct? Correct. Whoa. Um, Voyage, Most of the time. Voyage Clinic's data is not pullable right. by any of those people, by the right. way. It's one of the things that we have like worked hard to like make that so. Um, and so insurance companies don't have access to our stuff. But I, w I mean, every single, almost 99% of clinics out there, they their data is accessible by them, but also by the government mm -hmm. to just pull data whenever they want on people. And I, I don't, from a protection standpoint, I think that's silly, but... Um, but anyway, I, I, I digress a little bit. So, so, uh, continue your story. 27 year old family looking for coverage, lost their job. You kind of went into the history a little bit of like the way that it used to be. Mm -hmm. Um, the environment of insurance has changed remarkably. Absolutely. Since I was a kid, like the, the mine that my dad worked at used to offer really great benefits. We had no co-pays, no deductibles, go see anybody whenever we want as PPO plan. Um, that environment has changed a lot. The Absolutely. price of that plan has changed a lot. So a lot of employers, especially smaller employers, are struggling to even offer coverage to their employees. So so again, this this family, let's say he found another job, but his employer is, has 15 employees and they can't afford to to pay eighteen to $2,700 a month to provide a high deductible bullcrap plan, group plan to his employees. Mm -hmm. um, and those are those numbers roughly in the ballpark for 27 year old dear look yeah yeah so, and so thousand to so those those employers are struggling to offer those plans so now it's, the onus is on this employee to go find it um mm -hmm. so let's go back to the original situation yeah post 2010 zach post 2010 don't okay. have coverage from an employer what does john the 27 year old with a wife and kids he was really attractive at 27. He's still really attractive. Oh, I just want to throw boy. that out there. Our guy wow. in the story or this guy over here? Hypothetical. Are we talking it's, hypothetical it's still? It's or? you. Oh, it is me. Oh, yeah, it's you. I didn't know the guy in the story was me. Yeah. Okay. 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 How many, so how he's many 27. He's got three kids. Three kids. He's okay. married. He doesn't have insurance. It's after the ACA was passed in 2010. After two. Now what? Oh, okay. Perfect. So, Dr. Sanders, did you know that you're health insurance premiums are based on the size of your taxable household and based on your income. Mm -hmm. So that's try not to get political here in that, in this conversation, the affordable care act or Obamacare, Trump care, Biden care, whatever, whatever you want to call it, 
it's the Affordable Care Act. There's a lot of good things about it. Yeah. So when it passed in 2010, you're, it essentially what it did is it did away with the your pre 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 existing conditions. Yes. So let's say, well, let me. I'll throw another curveball in there on in the 27 year old good looking gentleman with his Super wife and kids. Good looking, Super yeah. good looking. <laughs> um, but. In this scenario at 27, what would you estimate in this hypothetical? What would, what's their estimated income for the year? He's the only worker. He's making 65,000 a year. Just started a new job. They don't offer insurance. Okay. So 65,000 a year um, with a, how, how many kids? Three. Three kids. So family of five. Yep. So it goes on your, your premium. And it, it, there's actually an algorithm that it that goes into it. But um, when you purchase insurance through the Affordable Care Act through the marketplace, and we can talk about a little bit about that later, they name things things so strategically in government and politics. Mm-hmm. They 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 like the uh, meaningful use was the name of the policy that they created to encourage doctors to start using computers to document their things. Um, the affordable care act, you know, they name these things very strategically. It, it, neither one of those things are true in, in their words and their verbiage, but, <laughs> but it's, it's fascinating that <laughs> they say affordable. <laughs> it's like, huh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, but it's good that they got rid of the pre uh, existing condition clause so no longer could in Blue Cross at Nasigna now refuse to cover somebody with a pre-existing condition, which is one of the reasons they justified jacking up their rates so much. So their rates increased tremendously since 2010 and Absolutely. continue to increase every year. Um, and so, you know, that's their just one of their justifications for that. Absolutely. So, so, so this young man, 27 year old, 27 year old, married, good looking with three good looking kids. Yeah. Um, so the premium would probably be depending upon the, the size of the deductible. Yeah. Um, would be anywhere between $0 a month for a higher deductible HSA qualified health plan upwards of maybe 150 yeah. would be the most expensive. Yeah. Um, so, and then, and that plan, it, it, is there a high deductible with that plan? What does that plan look like if they go individually or with you? Mm-hmm. Okay. Zach, you, your company is called optimized health plans. Yes. And I know this because I refer to you often to, for my clients, because I like you and I trust you. Um, what, is the benefit of them going with you instead of going on to what is the .gov thing? The healthcare.gov. Healthcare.gov. So they go to healthcare.gov. They try to navigate that space. What's the benefit of utilizing you instead of going directly to healthcare.gov? So the benefit is is somebody that actually understands the Affordable Care Act and how it works. Yeah. The ins and outs of the Affordable Care Act. All in all, the the Affordable Care Act, the legislation itself is nearly is is more than 10,000 pages in at, in interpretation once the attorney's got no offense against the attorneys but once Some the ticket. attorney's got <laughs> got a hold of it after interpretation after interpretation and reiteration it became rather lengthy not a whole lot of people understand it so the advantage of going with a broker or an agent that understands the affordable care act is they can Um, look at your individual situation and they can guide you through um, and, and pick the best plan that's for your situation. I see you as an advocate for them in a very convoluted space. Um, Yes. It's similar. We just did a podcast. Sean and I actually did this podcast on family physician and how to utilize your family physician and, and the role of a family physician in advocating for you in this very convoluted healthcare system. How do I get in to see this person in a timely manner? How do I get my records from this hospital? How do your family doctor can really collaborate all of, facilitate all of those spaces very, very efficiently. And you've done that for a lot of my clients. Like they would go directly to healthcare.gov 
and do their best. And, and they're like confused, struggling, frustrated. Mm -hmm. They just give up and they delete the whole account. And, and I'll send them, I said, no, you got to talk to my guy, Zach, and you can just break it down in simple, easy to understand language that, and just help them navigate that whole mess. It's, it's yeah. awesome, man. I really appreciate your work. Oh, thank you. It's cool. Um, okay. So you help them, you get them signed up family. Now they sign up for a Cadillac plan and they're paying $120 a month mm -hmm. and they've got really great coverage now. Okay. Right. That's a great story. See? So now, now as an individual who has empl employed making a certain amount of money, I know that I can qualify for plans. If it, if I wanted to go with a higher deductible plan, maybe it's 50 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. But the, I took the Cadillac plan. It's 150 for my, me and my family. I got a kid with diabetes. Um, so type one. And so I wanted the zero out of pocket plan. And that that plan still costs a lot of money, a lot. Oh, absolutely. Of money. But for me and my family, it only costs $150. That plan probably still costs $2,800 a month. Probably about $1,800 or $1,900 a month. or $1,900 a month for a young family, three kids, one with type 1 diabetes. And, and so it's being subsidized by whom? It's being subsidized by uh, through the Affordable Care Act. So, uh, which is essentially um, the taxpayers. Okay, and and is there a situation? Let's say, oop, my wife got a job and she made an additional. She's she's a baller. She made a hundred thousand dollars that year. Did not anticipate that. Um, what would that do to that plan for me and my family of five? It's a great question. At what? couple of variables at what part of the year did she get that job that she made? So was that income for the, that year? It was. So she for actually twenty seven thousand. Yes. So she's going to make more next year, but because she started late in the year, three months in, um, she only made a hundred thousand. So I guess 165 would be our gross income now. 165. Okay. So that plan, uh, family of, so the kind of fine print of that of yep. Affordable Care Act, this that 27,000 pages. Yes. Yes. So it's based on your level in the size of your family of FPL, which stands for federal poverty level. So at 165,000, a family of five, you're now above 400% uh, of federal poverty. You still qualify for a subsidy, but it's, it's not that much. So- mm -hmm. Maybe that family of five qualifies for five hundred dollars a month. If they still want that Cadillac plan, they're going to be paying closer to eight or nine hundred dollars a month for that plan, or mm -hmm. in this scenario, twelve hundred dollars a month for that eighteen hundred dollar a month plan. Okay, you did math really quickly in your head. Um, I want to break that down just a little bit. So, okay. so do we know what the FPL federal poverty level is? What is, is there a number there? Like says this Absolutely. much per person, this much per mm -hmm. dependent. Can you, can you break that down? It changes every year, yep. just like insurance yep. does. So it goes up. It started, uh, back in 2010, the federal poverty level for a family of one was $11,080 and it, it has increased. So we're now what, 14 years into it. And it's now 15,000 something per individual. 16,000 plus. Right. Change. Okay. So let's just say 16,000 nice round numbers, um, 400 times. So four times 16, it would be like 64. Oh, right. Well, well, I, I knew the number, but I was just right. saying that is the cap at which you qualify for a subsidy. For a family of I one. I didn't really know the number, by the way. Thanks for doing math for me. Okay. I'm not an engineer. I'm a doctor. I just don't know that. <laughs> I think it would be a mathematician. Oh, instead yeah. of a doctor. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Engineer students yeah, are mathematicians. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so- so 64,000 per person. Mm -hmm. So if I have two people. You are okay. looking, it, it's not a linear increase. Right. It's not two people times it by two. Um, but that 400%, it's all on, it's all published by the IRS. It's all on a form. And so we're able to Look figure, at that. Out, figure and, it out. Right. So two people, the number changes, mm -hmm. maybe just a little bit more, 80 something thousand. I'm not sure. Three people, it changes again. Four people, it changes again. Five, right. six, et cetera. 
So uh, you said a family of five, they could make up to what amount to still qualify for a reasonable plan through the not so affordable care act. Not so affordable. They can, it, it just depends on what they, um, their needs. Yeah. Their, their individual situation. Okay. Because throwing in another variable, um, you have gross income and you have net income. So self-employed individuals, it, let's say Shauna was an independent contractor, did legal work and was pulling in gross 100000 but her net, her adjusted gross income was less than that. So there's so many different variables that go into calculating that number. But in general, it- This the, is why it's important to have you, by the way, because you know the game. You know the system. You know the rules of the game really, really well. So it's kind of like you hire an accountant or a CPA who understands or a tax firm who understands the tax code Yeah, exactly. because it's long and convoluted exactly. and you do that yeah. to try and understand and save money on your taxes. Yeah. Same reason why somebody uses a broker to go through. They can do it themselves. You can file your taxes, fill out your taxes yourself yep. in hopes, but you hire an accountant in hopes that that because they know the code, they can help you save money. If you don't know it off the top of your head, it's fine. But if you do, a family of two, no kids, what is that cutoff point for that young family? And then can we go from there? Can we do a family of three, four, five, six? You probably don't have these numbers memorized. You have sure. so <laughs> that's the family of two is about ninety thousand. Okay, okay, okay. Is is the four hundred percent mark? Mm -hmm. Now here's the here's let me kind of talk. Um, kind of history in 2019, the, uh, the president or Congress or whoever does that back there, they passed, passed a law, um, that made it. So, so from 2010 to 2019, if you, you have the chart, if you want a penny over that 400% mark, you paid everything, everything back. back, the whole subsidy. The so whole that, subsidy. So that, if you were getting a, a $2,000 a month subsidy, if you were self-employed yeah. and I had a couple of clients that, that this happened to, yep. um, they sold a piece of real estate that was not their primary residence. And that's a tax thing. Talk to your tax guy about that, but it, in, it, their income increased substantially. Yeah. They didn't even see it coming. They didn't see it coming. The opportunity was right, but they had to pay. They went, one client was $120 over the 400% mark. Paid it all back. Paid $24,000 back. Ooh. So that, they called it the subsidy cliff. 2020, that went away. Tell me about it. So um, there's that chart, that federal poverty level, if you were at 401, so if so the, what, if you pass the 400%, the, the federal poverty, le, poverty level now, it's more of a graduated it, payback correct. thing. So it's not like you pay a hundred percent, but if you go over by 1%, 2%, 10%, there's an, there's it's, kind of an it's amortized. More of a, like, correct. Okay. It, it's more gradual. So the fine print again of the affordable care act, the 400% mark is still important because in the Affordable Care Act, it states that, so at the end of the year, you get a form called the 1095A from the marketplace. It's, it's automatically sent to you. And if you have an agent and you don't know where you put it, you call your agent, your agent can get that form You're for like you. You're like three steps away from losing me. Okay. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let me dumb it down. It's like with chat GPT. I yeah, say, exactly explain, it down, it, dumb it down. explain this like I'm a five-year-old. Yeah. So, which I did just. Well done. So it's the equivalent of receiving your W-2 from your employer so you can pay taxes yeah, at the yeah, end yeah. of the year. Excellent. The 1095 is from the IRS so you can reconcile your taxes for health insurance. You speak so clearly. It's incredible. Wow. It's incredible. <laughs> wow. Um, so this 1095A form will say, okay, Zach, you made $60,000, but on your application for health insurance, you listed, you estimated $40,000. So at the end of the year, that um, there's a reconciliation. So your accountant or yourself filling out on TurboTax, you use the information on the 1095A to fill out the form 8962 
or your tax person uses that form. You should just leave off the numbers. Okay. Another form. Another form. Uh Another queue form. (laughs) (laughs) And that form says, okay, you, if your um, income estimate, if you estimated or if you used this closer number, if you estimated 100, your premium would have been this much. Let's say $200 more a month times that by 12, that's $2,400. You reconcile that on the bottom of the form. So you you reconcile your advanced premium tax credit. There's a cap on page 15 of the instructions of this specific form that I'm telling you about um, or sharing with you. Now, I'm not a tax professional. I can't give you tax advice. I can just tell you what the form is. It's an 8962, page 15, bottom right corner, table five. It says repayment, um, repayment cap. Um, if you're under that 400%, the most that you'll pay back at the end of the year is, and it gives you a cap. If you're single, it's right now it's set at 1800. And if you're married, it's 3000 per month, per year, per year. Okay. So, um, it's super important to, if you have in that situation of the 27 year old with the wife that gets a job as a, or, or starts a business and makes $100,000 a year, you're going to have a reconciliation at the end of the year because you make more money. Um, and then you're going to have to pay it back. You're going to have to pay it back. And in that scenario, a family of five, you're over the 400%. So the cap on table five doesn't exist. So you pay the full amount, the full difference between the $65,000 estimate in the $160,000 estimate. Because there's a difference in the amount that you would have paid per month. Correct. If you had been at that higher income bracket. Correct. And that difference is rarely 100% of the payback? It's it's tough to get mm. to the 100% because now it's not a- It's a graduated- It's a graduated. Path. So I recently met with a- with a client that had 10 kids. So there were a taxable family. Uh, there were a couple sets of twins in there. Um, it's a taxable household of 12 people. He had a company, a construction company that was, um, his net, his modified adjusted gross income was the family. They were around 200,000. They still qualified for an advanced premium tax credit at 200,000 of about $1,800 a month. So we've we've changed language a little bit. Advanced premium tax credit is the same as a subsidy. Sorry. Yes. That the advanced premium tax credit is the same thing as a subsidy. Got it. It's just IRS terms versus layman's terms. Got it. Um, Say that right. Yes. Okay. (laughs) Okay. So, um, so I'm sorry to throw the convolution into the mix, but you see how convoluted it is. Um, and why it's so important to have people who have lots of forms memorized and and sub forms and sub pages, even pages of the forms. That, that's impressive flexing of your brain. I think, um, so. I think that's really, really cool. So, OK, uh, I think if you're it's worth it as an individual or family, if your employer doesn't offer a benefit to speak with somebody like Zach, optimizehealthplans.com, OHP.com. Um, and have them help you navigate that space. If it so happens that you make more than that, let's say we're way above 400% the national poverty level. I'm mm-hmm. a successful 28 year old. It's been a year. I found this really cool business and we're crushing it. Tech startup. Tech. Just oh, yeah. do a tech I'm, startup. I basically yeah. changed professions, became a programmer. Now I make 400,000 a year. Okay. Perfect. Um, so congratulations, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Those guys, they crush it. Uh, they're the new doctors out there, by the way. Um, doctors don't make that much anyway, by the way. Um, so oh. so um, what options are out there for that person if their employer doesn't offer a benefit? Let's say they're way, way above 400%. That's a good space to break down briefly. Are there some options out there for them? Yeah, there there are... Um, that aren't eighteen hundred, nineteen hundred a month, twenty seven hundred dollars a month plans. Yes, there's quite a few options, mm-hmm. uh, and again, it just depends on. I've met some clients that, if they're 
four hundred, five hundred thousand a year. They just said, you know what? I Not I want I want the Cadillac plan, and I want mm. I don't care if it's um yeah you know the income doesn't or matter. Two. I don't really care. I'm just going to use I'm it as a write off. Yeah, those are few and far between. Yeah, um, but the clients that money does matter and coverage is important. Um, you know, there's a couple different options they could um with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the marketplace, um, we can put people through uh, the marketplace that have pre-existing conditions because through the marketplace, through healthcare.gov, there's no pre-existing conditions. So, and then the other family, uh, the other family members can go uh, more of a non-traditional route, maybe a, a health share plan, Christian health share ministries or Zion health share. Uh, we've used that program quite a bit. Yeah. There's a um, bunch of these health shares. Let's speak to those in a minute. Okay. I want you to finish your thought though, because this is cool. So what you're saying is like, maybe I have a kid with type one diabetes and my wife has rheumatoid arthritis. Both of them are on very expensive medicines. I need traditional coverage for those people in my family. I can go to the marketplace through you. We can find them plans specific to those two people. And then, then maybe for the rest of my family, three other kids and myself, we might, we might offer, uh, like a, a health share, a like health a, share, like a Zion health share, Sedera's one, mm-hmm. Christian health ministries, uh, Samaritan ministries. There's a whole bunch of them. There's a, a lot of them um, there. Can we, can we dive into the health share space a little bit? So, so, um, I like that strategy, by the way, I think that's a really creative way to meet the needs of our people. Um, we have, I do have families that have pre-existing conditions and the health shares tell them, no, we're not going to do it. Or you got to wait four or five years and until we cover anything to do with that mm-hmm. pre-existing condition. Um, so let's talk about the health shares. Shauna, I want you to talk about those, those for a little bit. Can you speak to the health share space? Sure. Okay. So health shares are not insurance but they do function in some of the same ways that insurance functions. So it's basically like you pay into a general fund that other people in the co-op pay into. And then as you have medical needs, then you ask the health share to help with those medical needs from that big pot that everybody's paid into. And usually they have what's called an initial unshareable amount, which is the same thing as a deductible, but it's not called a deductible. Uh, for legal reasons. And so once you have paid your initial unshareable amount, then sometimes the health share will pay your um, medical expenses at the time of service. More often, they'll ask you to pay for in upfront if you can, so you can get any cash discounts that are available, and then they'll reimburse you for the amounts. And sometimes You go to the doctor or whatever facility you need, and then you send the bills to the health share and they pay the bills for you. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. Um, Health shares, price point. Can we speak to that? Do we know roughly what that looks like? I mean- They vary a little bit, but they've all gone up a little bit this last year. Yeah. And it really depends on the size of your family and the age of the people and then what initial and shareable amount you want to have. But I'm going to say- Anywhere between three hundred dollars a month to seven hundred and fifty dollars a month, depending mm-hmm. for on for a family, correct? For a family, an oh. individual might be closer to like the two hundreds a month. I'm not sure because I have a family, so I've never looked. Yeah, at that, I've seen them for like yes. eighty to a hundred and something. Yep. depending yep. on age. Yes, depending so on age age okay. and initial and shareable amount. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, that's great. That's really great. Yeah. So I think we have an understanding of the health share space. The, the caveat to the health share is they're not insurance and they don't right. 100% guarantee they're going to cover things. Right. They are um, not regulated by the state insurance department. And so they're not mandated to provide certain amounts of coverage. Now, the other caveat to that is insurance companies that are regulated by the state insurance department have many ways of getting out of providing the coverage that they are mandated to provide. That's so a great point. you pick your poison. No, that's a really great point. Actually, yeah. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Um, I see families getting sunk because their insurance refused to cover a thing because it right. was coded incorrectly or because Correct. of this thing or mm-hmm. that thing. And they yeah. sneak around things all the time. Um, the health shares in general are are intended to pull together a bunch of people's mm-hmm. revenue 
that they're all putting into this thing monthly to cover right. the masses and try to maintain health and do all these things. So I, I think they're they they're doing some interesting things. Um, we have clients at Voyage Clinics that have health shares, a whole bunch of them: Christian Health Ministries, Zion Health Share, Sedera, wow. um, uh, Samaritan Ministries. There a whole bunch, and um, for the most part, I've seen pretty good results there with regard to coverage. With regard, one of them, uh, uh, my my client had his wife got breast cancer and they covered it. They covered it. And that's a really expensive thing. The chemo, the treatments, the, the, everything, the surgery, everything. Um, so I, I think it's interesting. They're, they're doing some good things out there. Um, there have been some health shares out there that I've seen that one in particular, I, I don't know if there's any more like this, but they kind of got too big for their britches mm-hmm. and then they stopped really communicating, really covering, really doing anything. And, and that was really frustrating for a lot of my clients that were with that with that group. I'll, I'll refrain from mentioning names, but um, they were quite, in my opinion, shady in that space because they stopped actually delivering anything close to what would be considered reasonable health share coverage. Right. Um, there's an in between, so health shares might be on the cheapest end of the four above. So we're talking about a group that's above 400 percent the national poverty level, families, and don't have insurance through their employer. Um, trying to navigate that space individual, or maybe they're self-employed, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we navigate that? We talked about health shares. We talked about traditional insurance for maybe some of the family members and then doing health shares for the rest. That tends to be maybe the most cost-effective way to do that. Let's talk about it in between. Okay. (laughs) You know where I'm going. So indemnity (laughs) plans. So these (laughs) plans are um, US Health Advisors is one of them. There's a few other, I think they're backed by um, United U- U.S. Health, uh, um, they just got bought well, out several years. Well, a couple years been ago, three, three years ago, they got uh, they were purchased by uh, United Healthcare. Yeah. So um, indemnity plan. Zach, you want to tackle this? Shana, who wants to tackle this? <laughs> Maybe we can tag team it. I, I wanted to say it. Just let me just say it from my the, standpoint. They, I'm, they I'm not a purpose. I'm not they, a broker. I'm not smart like you guys. But from my standpoint, indemnity plan in a nutshell is. We cover some things. You got to roll the dice <laughs> on what you think you're going to get, and then you buy insurance for those diseases. I Correct. think I might get cancer. I'll buy the indemnity plan for that covers cancer. Mm-hmm. I think I might end up with, you know, like a heart attack or stroke. I buy that indemnity plan. So you mm-hmm. get a menu, like an a la carte menu, and then you pick what diseases you're most likely to succumb to, and you buy those. Is that my... Is my assessment accurate? Oh, that's a cool way to say it. I have not heard it said that way, but that's that's a neat way to say it. Zach? Absolutely. So prior to 2010, because that's the direction I went when with the chiropractor visit that I had in you my You had an chart. indemnity plan at that time? I, yes. So the old, um, it was called MAGA, not Make America Great Again, but th- there was another, <laughs> take a step back from the politics, but- um, there was a, an indemnity plan that was specifically offered to self-employed individuals that had pre-existing conditions. It was an indemnity plan. They got they got sued. They went out of business. Um, so yes, ex- exactly that. They're not obligated to cover things, um, but again, they serve a purpose um, for a certain demographic of of individuals if you don't those plans are not regulated by the um they are regulated by the department of insurance but they do not have to cover the the 10 essential health care benefits of the ACA. of the aca oh. um so pre-existing conditions they can uh, rate you up or they can deny you for pre-existing conditions i've seen that a lot of my and, patients get denied for pre-existing conditions with these indemnity plans um but again i'm not they serve a purpose, yeah. And I think that I think to be fair, we might I might want to bring on a person who has who sells these indemnity plans to just kind of talk to it, talk to it a little bit, um, just for further clarification. Um, my I sat with them for quite a while, and we went over it, and I was confused thoroughly at the end as to what is actually covered and not covered, and when. It seems like on Wednesday certain things are covered, Thursday or not. <laughs> but on. that same holds true for traditional insurance for me. I am super confused. It is one of the triple C's of the problems with health insurance right now. Cost, confusion, care. And 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 so we just don't know where and coverage will add a fourth. So we just don't know where 
we're going to end up. How many times people go to the, the doctor's office, they they have insurance and they come out and they're like, what? I got to pay for $800? What? I thought I had insurance. I pay $600 every month to have this insurance. And I, I went to the doctor and I paid and it, another 800 bucks. He ordered some labs, he ordered a CT scan. And I, you know, I saw the, I, I saw the doc, like, what is going Case on? in point, mm-hmm. just brief. Yeah. Uh, someone I know recently that took a Cologuard test, which is a test for rest, is a stool sample that tests for blood in the stool. That Colon would, cancer screening. Colon cancer screening once test. Once a year. Yes. So your insurance will pay either for Cologuard or a colonoscopy to screen for cancer, a, a screening colonoscopy. Well, this person got a, a positive Cologuard result, so needed to go get a colonoscopy to see what is causing that positive Cologuard result, but uh, was told that the insurance wouldn't pay for that colonoscopy because they already paid for a Cologuard in the same year. Well, I happened to ask Dr. John about this, and he said, no, there's two different codes for a colonoscopy. One is a screening colonoscopy, and they will only pay for one screening exam per year, Cologuard or colonoscopy. The other one is a diagnostic colonoscopy that they have to cover. And so I told this person who called back and then found out that, yes, actually, if it's a diagnostic colonoscopy, it will be covered, right? But see the confusion there? Like Mm -hmm. this patient is looking at $5,000 out of pocket to figure out why she that, you know, they got a positive Cologuard. Like that's just like, it's all so confusing and it pushes people away from getting like the care that they need to find out if they have, you know, an issue in the colon because of the confusion of insurance. So that's sorry, good. that that's was a, a little segue. Example. No, that's a good example. Yeah. Um, most people don't know the difference between a screening colonoscopy and a diagnostic colonoscopy or right. that that is even a thing. Um and so therein lies some confusion. I will say like for Voyage Clinics patients, at least like we help them navigate that very clearly. No, nope, they will pay for that. And we advocate for the patient to get that done for free as it should be. We're covered by insurance, at least to whatever degree their insurance will allow that. Um, okay. Wolf, we went on a really fun journey. We talked about individuals coverage through the ACA. Um, we talked about high income earners and maybe how they can appreciate coverage for their families um, without, you know, the employer just covering that. Um, I think the dynamics are interesting and it seems like the only people that are consistently winning in this equation are the insurance companies because they're always getting paid 1900 to $2,700 a month for these families to get these coverages. It doesn't matter if it's subsidized by the government or just paid through individually or if it's, or if it's covered by your employer like they are getting paid. The insurance companies get paid regardless of who's paying it. Yep. Yep. Um, I, I think the next phase, we don't have a ton of time to discuss, but I would love to spend more time in small employers, self-employed spaces. How do we provide coverage or, or, or some kind of benefit to our employees affordably, um, and, and really good, reasonable coverage for our employees. Um, small businesses, I think it's their second highest expenditure behind payroll, right? Like mm-hmm. I'm, paying, I'm paying my front office person, my back office person, and then I'm paying their insurance. And it's it's as much as I pay them, <laughs> you know? It's, a lot of times that's the case. really expensive to do that. So for small employers who maybe um, can't afford to co- to provide that coverage and aren't mandated to provide that coverage less than 51 employee shops, right? Um, how do they navigate this space? I, I think Zach and I, we've come up with some creative solutions. We've, we've helped a few little companies navigate into this direction. And if we can just spend the next few minutes, Shauna, we're going to have to table our discussion about the larger employers and I drove all the way up here just to talk about health shares. But, but you shared a few really cool <laughs> okay. examples. It's too. fine. That, that That's true. Great, okay. Let's better. let Zach take it away because I think he'll finish off a lot better than my discussion of colonoscopies. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Zach, are you due for a colonoscopy? We should probably this. <laughs> <laughs> That's HIPAA. That's uh, a totally different law. <laughs> let's not talk about it. <laughs> yeah, we won't go there quite yet. Um. So let me take a step back and first 
don't go back in the future. We don't have time for it. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> what I found is there's two parts to healthcare. Mm -hmm. There's coverage that under, understanding the ACA, we're able to help a lot of people get coverage. But there's also a component over here that I think is more important. Um, and this is kind of my journey of why, how I came to know you, mm -hmm. um, is the care component, coverage and care. Um, one can exist without the other, but to have a great healthcare plan, you have to have both components. Yeah. I feel. Um, so what I was finding, I would have a lot of clients that were self-employed or that were small business owners that had, you know, three to 20, 30 employees. They said, Zach, we really want to offer something to our employees to show them we care, to take care of them, to, to, they'd have clients that would, or not clients, but employees that would go to work for a competitor for a 50 cent an hour raise just because they offered, or even less money because they offered benefits. But especially with the way the, the economy is, um, it, it's a really a struggle for small businesses to afford that 12 to $2,000 a month. So I was looking for, I wanted to find something um, that an employer could offer that would offer that component of care and follow it up with coverage on the back end. So for, for self-employed individuals, for small, um, small companies, fewer than 50 employees. And the reason I use, we use the word term 50 is because that's a delineator with the affordable care act of if you're 50 full-time employees or FTEs, full-time employee equivalents, um, <clears throat> which we can get in later, but we not right now. Not right now. Okay. Um, they're not, you do not have to, or you're not obligated by law to offer an employee benefit. So how could we offer something to those employees and that showed coverage and care that wouldn't break the bank? Yeah. So that, um, if an employer, what I found is in the Affordable Care Act, it says, in one of the questions on the application, are you eligible for benefits through an employer? The question should read, are you eligible for affordable benefits through your employer? Yeah. Affordable uh, to the to the people that wrote the law the and to a person is not to a person that is has three kids and making $65,000 a year struggling to put food on the table. It's two different things. Mm. Can we just talk to this for a minute? So, so you've made a beautiful, beautiful point. I'm an employer. I have 25 employees. I'm, this is a hypothetical scenario. Um, I offer a benefit to my employees. My employees are not high, high income earners. My benefit costs them six to $800 per paycheck or no per month. So month. three to $400 per paycheck. Most of my employees opt out of that because they cannot afford that three to $400 per paycheck to pay for that group plan that has a $3,000 per person, $12,000 max out of pocket per family deductible plan. Cause that's the plan I can afford. And that's the plan that they cannot afford. And yet I offer to my employees and it screws them because they're not even signing up for it. And it screws them out of your point right now that you're going to make is now I'm uneligible to go to the ACA and, and get a plan Correct. myself, even though I would totally qualify for it because I'm getting paid, you know, 50,000, I got four kids and my wife makes another 40,000 and, and we're making ends meet, but we would qualify through the ACA with your help for an awesome plan. Awesome plan. Except but because my employer offers a sucky plan that I can't afford and I opt out of, I can't go to the ACA and get this sweet plan. Correct. So it's a disservice to offer that plan to your employees as a small employer, at least. Yes. That was your point. I get it. I feel that. So, and I, I have patients that are in that boat and it infuriates me 
And I'm like, let me talk to your employer. Let me come in and just talk to them because they're screwing their employees by not <laughs> offer, by offering them a benefit. They're actually hosing them by offering them health insurance. But they're wanting to do, their intentions are good. Their intentions are good. They just don't know yeah. the ACA. Right. Yeah. That's so, what we're finding. So if that employer dissolved their group plan, I no longer offer this benefit, this group plan to my employees. Instead, I'm creative. I'm, I'm thinking, and this was your, your other really great idea, which is really brilliant, actually, to offer Voyage clinics to their employees for what? care. <laughs> you just stole your thunder. <laughs> I feel so deflated right now. <laughs> I was offer building Voyage. Up, building up, building up, and then I'm deflated. Okay. So Voyage Thank Clinics you. comes in at a price point of maybe 15% of that group plan, but gives zero deductible care anytime. Telehealth, video chat, come in as much as you want. No co-pays. Uh, affordable everything out there to their employees. Now they give their employees white glove medical care. And then and then what do their employees do in addition for coverage with optimized health plans? I mean, we just did this with a company and it was awesome. Right. So in that particular situation, that allows the employees to then, they no longer have affordable coverage offered through their employer. Um, so it allows them to be able to go through the marketplace through yeah, healthcare.gov. You, you, you phrased that wrong. And, okay. They, they no longer have an insurance sucky group plan through their employer. Well, I didn't want to use that type of terminology. Yeah, it but was yes, a they, terrible group plan that. But what it says on the on the marketplace application is do your does your employer offer benefits and now they can say no right yes which is a which is actually a favor to their employees absolutely go there because a lot of the employees so will be able to go through and now it's based on their household size and income so the same family that's making ninety thousand dollars a year with four kids um, they are in a certain percentage level. And we have algorithms that we plug it in. And Don't make it jump. complex. Okay. They're able to qualify for a subsidized health plan. Yes. Through healthcare.gov and pay $100 a month or less. Okay. Let's say $100 or less a month for a suite plan. Mm -hmm. Now that plan does not have a $3,000 per person deductible if they choose that plan. Correct. Um, that plan is a better plan than the group plan that they were offered at their employer and now they're paying $100 a month, but they have to pay for it out of their own paycheck. That's kind of hard. Mental gymnastics. So before they were going to have to pay three to $600 a paycheck for a sucky, three to $400 per paycheck for this sucky group plan. Now they don't offer that plan. They get to pay $100 per month for a sweet Cadillac plan. And they actually, the employees actually save money by doing that. Correct. It's just the perception from the employee is I have to provide my own insurance. Right? Yeah. So that's the mental gymnastics move that, that, em, that employees and employers have to understand and, and explain to their employees. No, we're actually doing you a favor by dissolving this group plan that right. you can't afford or sign up for anyway. And in fact, we're going to bring in Zach, who's going to come help you navigate your family's specific needs with the ACA. He understands it better than we do. And you're going to get to pay for that. Well, gosh, now I got to pay for my own insurance. Yeah, you get to. The alternative was you to pay $400 a paycheck. In their minds, it's a, it's a mental trick because they didn't even see that money. So it didn't ever exist. And right. insurance companies are smart. That's the way they get paid dog. That's super smart because then it never hits the brains of the people that are actually paying for it. But they, they really are paying for that. And so, so, so anyway, it's just a mental little gymnastic flip that they have to flip in their minds. It's a paradigm shift. It is. It is. I like your word better than mine. And if, if you think about it, what, what was happening before is not only were they already paying it and not realizing it, but they were letting their employer decide what to pay for it. That would be like going to your employer and saying, uh, I need dinner. And so take $400 out of my paycheck and then go to the grocery store and buy food for me and send it to me. What if you're allergic to shellfish and your employer just decides to send you shrimp? Mm -hmm. Like it's your money, but by offering a group plan, your employer is spending your money for you and you don't have a say in how it's spent. Mm, I like it. In this way, you get your money and then you decide how it's spent and it's 
much less expensive, and you choose what coverage works best for you. I like it. It's not a one-size-fits-all option or mm. all shrimp, because I don't really like shrimp. Mm. Shrimp is delicious. I know. John does. Sometimes it, sometimes it is. It, it just depends on if yeah. you like Mexico or something. And okay, I deep residency yeah. in, in Jacksonville, yeah. we used to go shrimp. And I take that. The, the big prawns that are like battered in coconut and deep fried, those are good. Those are pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Guys, glad we could hash out the shrimp thing. Um <laughs> <laughs> this is really, really smart and really, really important. So so just to put that in perspective, the individual's employees, by n- dissolving this plan, we're saving them an average of six, 7000 a year mm-hmm. by dissolving their plan. We're giving them better coverage that they get to go optimize and choose for themselves. Optimize health plans. I say what I did. Appreciate it. Um, Appreciate that. Or use a broker, use whomever you want. Go to the AC, figure it out. But but you get to pay for what your fam- what you want for your family much less than per paycheck you were going to pay for that psychic group plan. Correct. Um, so the employer saves a lot of money, a lot of money. The employees save six to seven thousand per per employee per year. <laughs> the employers save maybe that much per employee right <laughs> per year because they were having it with their employees or whatever. So that's a substantial savings to the company, a substantial saving to the employees. And, and then the option to, to, for the employer for goodwill, for a perk to offer something like a direct primary care clinic, like Voyage Clinics or a, a clinic near you that has similar benefits to mine, um, to your employees to really give them coverage. Workers comp injury happens. They call me, they call me, they come in, they get seen, they get stitches. We get it fixed up. That costs them zero dollars, so that's a substantial workers' comp mitigation for that they can also <laughs> that they can also benefit from. Um, I'm thinking other benefits to the small employer for doing this. I think they save a lot of money, mitigation for workers' comp, give a white glove perk to their employees for retention for recruitment. That they say, do you offer empl- employee benefits? Yes, we do. We do it creatively to save you and to save us money and to give you good care and good coverage. In a perfect. In a nutshell. In in a nutshell, that was that was great oh, because man. you touched on those two important parts: coverage and care. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really what I'm finding an employer wants to offer. Yeah, is is they want to provide a service, a benefit, and to have essentially. And I've I've used the term in house, but I'm now using near house physician, um, that you can call anytime. Of, and, and it's not, you go in and talk to a, a, a med student or a CNA, not that there's anything wrong with that or a there, but you see the doctor for five minutes. Yeah. It, it's about an hour. My visits with you ever since I got, um, the, the membership, and it's been five, six years now that we've had it, is is that care component is you'll sit down with me and you'll go over, hey Zach, what are your what are your goals here? What how are you feeling here? And here's your goals. Let's create a plan. There's not too many doctors with MD or DO or even PhD after their well, P, we won't go there, but <laughs> acronym. Um, that will sit down with you and and really treat you. Favorite line in Patch Adams is by Robin Williams. I love we, Patch Adams. We we treat the people, not the disease. And when you you'll have to. I just had a brain freeze. It's okay. You rhymed. Yeah. When. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. So anyway, watch Patch Adams if you haven't watched Patch Adams. Great movie, Great movie with Robin Williams. It really is what we're trying to do. We are like Patch Adams meets Netflix, right? You you pay monthly. You can come in as much as you want and you get really good care. I appreciate the shout out, Zach. Um, the reason I started Voyage Clinic six years ago, Sean and I worked really hard on this, um, was to fix the care component of healthcare. I just didn't like what I had to do strapped to the insurance game. Yeah. As a physician, I was unable to provide the type of care I believe families deserve. And so... Um, it's neat to do something different and it's neat that we can, as a team, offer tremendous savings to small companies and individuals 
and while still providing beautiful care to them. Most clients that we have at Voyage Clinics have insurance. Yeah. Digest that for a second, folks. It's a big deal. <laughs> um, thank you guys both for coming. Shauna, thank you for coming. Uh, sorry we didn't yeah. get to hear more from you. But it's okay. but I think I think this does need to be divided up. And I think we do need to talk about medium to large employer shops and what kind of benefits we can we can bring to the table there. Sure. Their equations are much different. Um mm-hmm. They have to offer benefits. They have to offer insurance. So, so how do you craft a plan that's cost effective for those employers, but then also meets the coverage and care needs of their employees? Is a direct primary care component or a clinic like mine um, is that is that integratable? Yeah. Um, so, lots of really great questions that we have for you um, in the coming months. So, hopefully, we'll do another. Okay. One. Could I leave a cliffhanger? Yeah, please. Yeah. You? So. What a lot of large, or what we're finding, uh, I've been doing this for almost 20 years now, um, but what a lot of large employers are doing, like large meaning tens of thousands of employees, is they'll offer really good insurance to the employee, like very, very affordable, that meets the standards of the affordability of the Affordable Care Act, um, which there's a percentage and it changes every year, but but then to add a family member or add a spouse, kids to that plan, it's no longer affordable. It's mm-hmm. that employer is in is um, they're in compliance. Mm. But what do you do with your family members? Oh, I see. so mm. there's that's a real obstacle. I didn't even think about that. And it's, yeah, I could see that. it's becoming more commonplace because employers can't afford. To the whole family. For the whole family. Wow. wow. To make it affordable coverage. So, And because they offer a benefit to that family, they can't go to the AC and grab their own plan. They can. Well, they can. They just fix it. It's called, but that's the cliffhanger. If yeah. I explain it here, it's no longer a cliffhanger. Oh, I'm going to hang that cliff. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right. Zach. All right. See, so yeah, no, we Zach, that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for tuning into Voyage Podcast, uh, Voyage <laughs> Clinics Podcast. Please like and subscribe. And I hope you learned some cool stuff. I did. This was great.